Well, we don't do big intros here. We just do hands. And it's 10, 15, show 16 with my man, Dan Raphael in the United States. How are you, big bro? I'm good, little bro, Gareth. You're, my, you're older than me, so you're older, bro, in London. Show me the cap. Same as last time, Showtime Championship Boxing. Okay, that hasn't changed. TV return to our airwaves. And, and listen, it's late in the evening here in the UK. I've got a light on me, that's why it looks light. But it's, uh, it's uh, sea bass, um, uh, sugar snaps, peas, and, um, and watercress. Beautiful watercress for me for dinner. It's about 2.15 in the evening, 2.15 in the afternoon where you are. You yes. must know what's for dinner. No, sir. What I'll tell you what, though, today's the day where when my wife will go out, she'll go to the local place that we have like a subscription to. She'll pick up the farm box. It's all locally grown stuff. And I'm sure that some kind of stuff in that will be part of whatever the dinner meal is. They'll have all kinds of different fruits and vegetables and, and locally grown stuff. So uh, there's always good stuff in there. Ah, right. I've got you now. What's your favorite thing in the fruit and vegetable box? They actually have had some of the good, like, uh, not, not, I will call, they're not sugar snap peas, but they're fresh peas where you pop them out of the pot. Oh, so, nice. Um, but they have all kinds of like good lettuce stuff and just you name it. I mean, it all depends. Sometimes corn on the cob depends on what, you know, what the season is uh, in terms of early summer, late summer, but a lot of good stuff. And where does the meat come from in the house then? Oh, that would, you know, in the supermarket. So what's what she been shopping for today in the supermarket? I have no idea. But at least we know what might be for starter anyway. Yes, we might we might know that. Okay, <laughs> I'm only doing it because some of the guys <laughs> that love watching us talking bull um, say Hello. you guys are slipping. You haven't talked about what's for dinner lately. <laughs> there you go. That's that's for you guys asking. Um, big oh, I've lost my light here. Um. Look, uh, don't worry, I'll carry on anyway. But um, I hope you can see me, Dan. I see you just fine. Um, look, uh, we're going to talk UFC for a bit today. Um, game bread fighter, as he's known, Jorge Masvidal from Miami, stepped up to the UFC 251 event this weekend, Saturday night, on six days' notice. He already holds the BMF belt in the UFC. Do you know what the BMF is? I do. What is it then? Uh, isn't it like the uh, the big MFR? The big motherfucker, yeah. I don't know if we can okay. say that on here, but we are. I mean, but... yeah, I, I, you know, I just figured, you know, I didn't want to swear on the on the show, but whatever. Yeah, no. so it was a, a belt that uh, that the UFC decided to make when they I forget what the match was. It was him against I forget who. Nate Diaz, him against yeah, Nate, Nate Diaz. Diaz. Exactly, that's right. Uh, as uh, to like, who's the toughest guy in the UFC? And well, who's the most popular? subversive yeah. who's the baddest who's exactly. the baddest ass in the ufc exactly who basically who can who can trump who on social media basically with kind of badass stuff yeah or badass shiz that gets under everyone else's skin but it still makes them popular and he is a brilliant guy i've known jorge masvidal for quite a long time he was a journeyman for a long time he knocked out a guy called ben Askren with a flying knee in Vegas last year, Askren had barely been beaten in his career and was a wrestler from the wrestling background. Masvidal, you'll know this guy, grew up street fighting in Miami in the street fighting culture under people like Kimbo Slice, yeah? That was very mm -hmm. famous where they had, you know, open street fights, organized, but open street fights. It was a sport in itself, but an unlicensed kind of raw sport. And that's where he came from. He's a brilliant guy. He's very interesting very much himself. Um, he's fighting a guy, Kamara Usman, who's the welterweight champion, 170 pounds in the UFC, in MMA that is. Um, he's a viable contender. He's got the style to do it. Um, but the original <clears throat> opponent has tested positive for COVID and can't fight. So he steps up. He gets the deal done. He's just landed there. Um, he was literally six days notice. He's revealed that he did the deal in the end. He was at a friend's or a home barbecue somewhere, took the call, did the deal, if that's true. And he's gone over on six days notice. It's a really... It's, a, it's an interesting way to kick off the Fight Island, right? It's a great way to kick off their Fight Island. And it's actually, um, I think... Uh, a better fight 
um, than than the original fight, really. Listen, I'm, I mean, I'm not a, as you know. I, I mean, I don't have anything against UFC, but I don't usually watch much of it. I'm not. I don't follow it on a on a hardcore basis. I know the bigger names. I've heard of Masvidal. I mean, you know, those tired Nate Diaz and people you've mentioned and that sort of thing. But, but Dan, you won't have heard of Gilbert Burns, who he was, who, who, uh, I'll, I'll just say good, good for, good for him to, to, uh, step up and take the fight on short notice for himself to obviously get a good payday and to be in a big spotlight, but also, you know, for the company and for the fans that will get treated, hopefully, you know, to a good main event on Saturday. For me, it's a win-win for him. He's only had six days notice. He's a guy who's always in shape. He's going to earn a few million dollars, I imagine, for this. Why wouldn't he fight? We, um, um, you know, we always say about fighters, be ready. But a lot of MMA fans, and maybe some of those in the Venn diagram of crossover, are saying that this couldn't happen in boxing. This would never happen in boxing. What's your take on this? Well, I've heard those comments, and it's just not accurate. I mean, it's, it's, it's not common and I don't think it's that common in UFC either I mean sure guys in both sports take fights on short notice from time to time but certainly not you know uh, a regular occurrence on like a weekly or a daily basis however in boxing we can come up with uh, various examples where absolutely uh, there have been fighters that have taken fights on short notice first of all probably one of the most famous ones of all time and it turned out to be a great fight and I think partly because of the short notice impact on both the challenger and the champion and that was of course the very famous fight that is still talked about to this day Gareth and that's the heavyweight title match in Los Angeles between the then heavyweight champion Lennox Lewis and Vitaly Klitschko, who were supposed to be in separate uh, fights on the same card with Lennox uh, in the main and Vitaly in the co-feature is a way to set up a fight that would have taken place later that year uh, against each other. But when uh, the opponent for Lennox Lewis, which was Kirk Johnson, dropped out because of an injury, uh, on short notice, they rearranged everything. They took it off of pay-per-view. They got a lot of extra money from the corporate offices to put the main event on live HBO. And, and Vitaly stepped up and fought Lennox and Lennox took the fight on a 10 days notice. And I was at that, fight. it was an extraordinary event. It was a great, right. event. and uh, you know, that may not be six days notice like they, like there is happening in the UFC this weekend, but in terms of a, it's a higher profile fight than what's happening in the UFC. That was the heavyweight championship of the world. Now granted that was, that's an unusual circumstance, but there have been plenty of examples. Uh, the one that I was tweeting about last night, which, which making the point that it could happen in boxing, because this was the shortest notice you can take a fight, basically. And that was the, uh, the, the famous story, which I guess a lot of people have forgotten about or didn't follow boxing back then. But in 1999, uh, there, was a, a, there was supposed to be a flyweight, a WBO flyweight title fight between Jorge uh, or Jose Lopez against Alejandro Montiel. And Alejandro Montiel in the dressing room uh, on the day of the fight, had some numbness in his side or some kind of physical issue, and he was ruled out of the fight. So he drops out of the fight, and they're sitting here with a card. People are already gathering. The, the undercard has begun. And sitting in the stands is a, a, a Mexican boxer named Isidro Garcia, who was a good contender at that time. He had the NABO flyweight belt, so he was in their ratings and was, you know, would have been eligible to fight for the title. And uh, they basically pressed him into service, asked him. He was literally sitting – you know, having a snack and then watching the fights. He was there as a spectator, not as a boxer on the undercard or anything. And uh, they called up his manager, Frank Espinosa, and asked him if he, would, if he was interested in doing the fight on that kind of notice. They went back and forth. And I'm like, you know, a few hours notice, he took the fight. Now, a lot of people said, what about the weight situation? Obviously, you know, the weight, uh, you're not, even if guys who are in shape are not on the exact weight of the, of the weight division, which is 112 pounds. But because... Um, Lopez had made the weight and the next day when he did like a second day weight check or stepped on the scales for TV or whatever, he was like 122 or 123 pounds. And because Garcia, they weighed him, he was 122, 123 pounds also. It was an even fight. So they, they let the fight happen. The, the, everybody agreed that that would be okay. And uh, what happened? Cedro Garcia went in there and won a, unit, won a decision against uh, Lopez and won the world title. So that happened on like three hours notice. So, you know, good for what's going on here on six days notice, but talk to me when you take a title fight on the day of the fight. Well, Dustin Poirier, one of um, the, his fellow fighters in, in the UFC has just tweeted just as we speak um, that he believes that Jorge Masvidal was training throughout anyway. And a lot of fighters do stay ready and they're very yeah. wise to stay ready. I think what well, makes you, this- You know the saying, right? It's you stay ready so you don't have to get ready. Exactly. Is, I've heard exactly. boxers say that to me for 20 years. Exactly. Uh, but then I think take it to heart and other guys don't, don't bother. 
Yeah, and I, but I think what's interesting about this is that he's had to, because it's this period of time and where it is, he's in Miami. Mm -hmm. So um, he has to test at home, first of all. He's flying to Abu Dhabi, yeah, yeah, to Yas Island, where there's very strict quarantines. He went on a private jet. He was eating pizza on the private jet. I saw the picture. You saw the picture. Apparently stopped in Italy for a pizza. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, and um, the funny thing is, um, when you get then to Yas Island, you've got to quarantine in your room. You do a test and you quarantine in your room for 24 to 48 hours. Then he's obviously got to do his weight cut. He says he's got 20 no. pounds to lose in the week. Why is the quarantine so long? And I ask you that because, again, I don't know what they're doing in the UFC specifically. But as an example, in the top ranked bubble in, in Las Vegas at the MGM, when the people that are associated with the event, whether it's the promoters or the fighters or the regulators, they enter the hotel, they take a test immediately, they go to their room, and it doesn't take more, you know, it's like maybe six or eight hours. A lot of, a lot of the people that I've talked to that are involved, they get to the hotel in the evening, they take the test when they enter the hotel, and then they just go to the room and go to sleep, and then when they wake up in the morning, they know if they're good or, or, or not good. There's a quarantine law there. So... Okay. So they've got to stay, they go there, their, temp, their temperature is checked as they come in. Um, I mean, John Morgan, who works for MMA Junkie, um, who, who's a kind of prolific cover of every detail of the UFC, of MMA, he's like their lead kind of writer, like you were with ESPN, he covers every tiny detail. Um, he outlined his journey in, and literally, you wait for a note under the door when it's your time to leave your room. But they check you into the hotel, they check your body temperature, all these things. So that's, that's just the quarantining legalities within, the, um, without, within Abu Dhabi anyway. So I think what's fascinating is he's got to go through all of that. He's saying he's got 20 pounds to lose. I bet he hasn't. I bet he's much closer to the weight. He's got a smart management team. They'll be putting the champion, the Nigerian nightmare he's called, Kamara Usman, who took the title from an American called Tyron Woodley, both renowned wrestlers, both with, with heavy hands as well, you know, wrestler brawlers. Um, it, th they will be trying to get into the head of Usman. What's made this even better as an event is that Masvidal has been saying to Usman since about January, when they came together at a conference, Masvidal wound him up. They almost had a fight at the conference. And he's been winding him up ever since, saying, you're fighting the wrong guys, you should be fighting me. And of course, hovering around this, your friend from MMA, that boxing guy, that boxing guy, Conor McGregor's hovering around fighting potentially Masvidal as well. Hold on, I gotta ask you a question about that. I mean, uh, you've refreshed my memory. Now, I don't think it was necessarily six days notice, but didn't Connor step in a couple of times on somewhat short notice to take uh, uh, UFC fights that turned out to be very big events? No, I think he had people cancel on him. Oh, I see, I see. Um, well, he certainly had Jose Aldo cancel on him. Listen, I, the, the point here is that we were talking about is that, you know, the, 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 the MMA fan or the MMA, the MMA sphere, the world of MMA, UFC, is making out the fact that he's taking this fight on six days notice, like he's the second coming for doing so. And I would simply say, good for him, because he's getting paid very well to do so. He obviously must be in some kind of condition to do it on that kind of notice. He's going to have to make the weight. And it's not as uncommon as people are making it out to be, is all I was saying. I'm not knocking anybody that's involved with the event. Just saying it's not, it, it's cool and everything, but it's not like an unprecedented situation by any means. And, but also remember, I mean, we're, we're crossing codes here and obviously I cover both sports, but it is a different tempo to the fight. It's a different thing as well. And, you know, if Masvidal is fight fit, he's got a great chance of winning. I don't think he will win, but if he mm -hmm. does, expect McGregor to be back. Because McGregor has won a belt at Phantom, a feather and lightweight and wants to win a belt at welterweight. So now, if he doesn't win, though, I don't. You know, nobody's going to give him grief. He's going to be like, "Look, you gave it a good shot. You took the fight on short notice. You took on who's been, you know, getting ready for a fight for a while. And uh, if, if it turns out to be an entertaining fight and he loses, you know, he, you know, and particularly the culture of MMA, they don't hold a loss against the fighter nearly as much as boxing fans hold it. Unfortunately, boxers. So, you know, he's sort of playing with house money. If he wins, you know, obviously it's big for him and it's huge. 
if he loses, like I said, not that big of a thing. You know, you gave it a shot, you saved the show, and you made some money. He didn't even save the show. It's made it much more interesting because right. people weren't that thrilled by Gilbert Burns because there's two other um, title fights uh, on the card as well. Mm -hmm. uh, Max Holloway and Alex Volkanovsky is very exciting as well. Holloway's a Hawaiian who had a very off night against this Australian Volkanovsky um, of Russian descent. And now he gets his opportunity uh, to come back. Um, it's going to be a great event for them. They've, they've, made, they've, they've actually top rank in the UFC, certainly in Las Vegas. Uh, well, obviously, the UFC went to Florida first. They've, they've, they've kind of paved the way. I wasn't, I've got to be honest, I thought they came back too soon. Uh, that was my feeling at the time. That was my honest feeling. Um, but they decided they were coming back, and it's kind of worked for them. But it's, it's still, as you know, they're with your, your former paymaster, ZSPN. They've got a big deal with them. Um, and they, you know, they're, they're a pay-per-view company. Um, so they felt the real need to come back. For me, it was a bit early, but it's worked out for them. Well, I mean, in the, in the UFC event, if I'm not mistaken, is a pay-per-view on ESPN this weekend also. Yeah, exactly. You know, the top rank shows that they've been putting on, you know, admittedly are not at the highest level, but um, they're giving it their best effort. I mean, you know, it, I suppose it's better than no live boxing at all. They had their fight uh, last night with, uh, you know, where, uh, you know, Zapata, uh, Jose Zapata won. You know, he's a good contender at 140 pounds, came very close to defeating Jose Ramirez for the title. A lot of people thought he won that fight. He got a, a good win the other night. And again, unfortunately, you know, he was supposed to fight Ivan Baranchik originally, but he dropped out because of an injury. But again, you know, they've, the top ranked people have been under a lot, of, a lot of stress because they've had guys drop out because of injuries like Baranchik, like Alvarez, and they've had other fighters that have been uh, knocked out of cards because of either a positive test to the boxer or to uh, one of the people on their team, of which point they have to leave the bubble. So, you know, they're, they're, they're muddling through, but, you know, I'll give them credit. They're doing pretty good job under some extremely difficult circumstances. They got a, you know, a pretty decent fight coming up on Friday night, which is the heavyweight fight where Gerald Miller was supposed to be in the main event, but because of, again, he was a guy that dropped out, not because of an injury, not because of a positive COVID test. He got thrown out of the fight because of a, yet another positive drug test. So they replaced him with Carlos Tackham, who we've discussed, you know, a former heavyweight title challenger, and he's taking on Jerry Forrest. As heavyweight fights go in, in an era, at a moment in time where there's not the biggest fights, it's a pretty good main event in my mind. I'm actually interested. That's one of the main events on ESPN. I'm actually more interested in uh, the last several weeks they've been doing this because of the, the unknown factor of, uh, of seeing these two heavyweights, you know, in a change of opponents, plus guys that are maybe a, a, a little bit below the top, top contenders. Well, I just spoke to Eddie Hearn. Guys. I just spoke to Eddie Hearn, actually, a little while ago. I'm playing it out on Talk Sport later on Saturday night. Um, it's a very long interview with him catch up with him I haven't spoken to him for several weeks and he was uh, saying that his 20 fights on his four nights of um, you know his his his, um, uh, his his own fight island um, backyard, Matt, we call that backyard fights backyard fights yeah um, but matchroom square garden as I they should have yeah. called it matchroom square garden the whole time I, I just think it's a beautiful name for it um he's saying that his fights are more competitive. A lot of them are more competitive than a lot of the top rank cards. And I do agree with him. I know that's the case, but I mean, I wouldn't expect any promoter, Eddie Hearn or anybody else to say anything otherwise. Obviously, in the promotion business, you're there to build up your events. And uh, look, I hope he's right. I hope that the, that the fights on the matchroom shows are, are exciting and competitive. Well, look, um, you know, look, Terry Harper and Natasha Jonas will be a good women's scrap. Um, uh, Katie Taylor, and he's getting close to signing Delphine Pers soon. There'll be a lot of interest in that. Um, Dillian White and Alexander Povetkin. I know that that's pretty much the pay-per-view ones, but we got some very good domestic scraps. Um, Jordan Gill, uh, Reese Bellotti, Ted Cheeseman, uh, these other guys, um, Josh, um, 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 Sam Eggington. They're going to go for it. They're going to try and entertain these guys. Doesn't always pay off. They haven't got a crowd there. It might bloody rain and be grey. You never know. Um, it's, it's Britain, remember? Um, I say it rains all the time, doesn't it? It's raining all day. It was raining all night, and it's grey right now. Um, you know, but he, I, I enjoyed his excitement, uh, having put it together. And, um, you know, he also said, and I completely agree, we haven't discussed this yet, if it does happen, um, Ryan Garcia and Luke Campbell. That is a cracker of a fight, isn't it? That's a very good fight. Now, the way that that came about was because Campbell was supposed to fight 
uh, for the interim title, I believe, against Javier Fortuna. Correct. They ended up taking another fight, so that was no longer there. And so I'm not quite sure why they couldn't just make Campbell against Haney for the title. Well, I don't know the reasons for that. But nonetheless, they ended up uh, making, you know, when, when Fortuna left that position, Ryan Garcia, uh, the excellent young fighter, undefeated kid from California, he was the next in their ratings that was available and apparently is willing to take the fight. Now, just because both sides say they're interested to do the match and maybe they'll engage in negotiation, they still have to actually make the fight. If it doesn't uh, come to fruition through a negotiation, they'll have to go through a purse bid. And then, of course, you got to see what the numbers are, whether or not the sides will end up living by whatever the bid is. So there's still a lot of things that have to happen before we know for sure that that fight's going to take place. But if it does, you know, that's a very, very big step up for Ryan Garcia. He's been fighting decent opponents so far over his last few fights as he rises the ranks. Campbell is a seasoned veteran. He's fought for world titles. He's been in Olympic gold medals. He's fought all kinds of different fighters. Um, but this is, a, that's a very interesting fight. I mean, like I said, one of the best young, mark, one of the most talented young guys in the sport and one of the most marketable young guys in the sport against a very savvy veteran who's been in the ring with a lot of quality opposition like Luke Campbell. That's a, I just, they can actually get it done and they can actually take place and not be uh, another thing where they talk about it and then they pull the rug out from under everybody. Well, yeah, exactly. Let's hope they don't tease us for too long. I'll give you another fact about Luke Campbell. Um, he's very, very hungry to be a world champion. He's yeah. our most decorated amateur in British boxing history, by the way, in I'm terms aware. of what he's won. The most decorated ever. So one, one fly in the ointment in that matchup, which I agree is a very good fight. But Ryan Garcia has another option also. They also ordered a fight because he's high up in the rankings for most of the sanctioning bodies. In the WBO, they ordered an elimination fight between him and Emmanuel Togo. Now, Emmanuel Togo is not as well known as Luke Campbell, but he's a good fighter. He's like 33-1. and one. He's on a very, very long winning streak. Um, He's now basing himself in the United States. He's, he, his uh, promoter is Lou DiBella. His manager is Peter Kahn, who's put together a very good stable of young fighters. And, and that's, uh, that's also, in my opinion, would be somewhat of a step up for Ryan Garcia. So he has, he has different options uh, to see which direction he wants to go. And I guess they'll, they'll see which the better deal is. But I, I, I guess based on uh, the comments um, from Mauricio Suleiman, who said that the Garcia camp indicated that they were going to uh, try to make the match with Campbell, that they'll explore that situation first. I guess if it doesn't work out, he can go the WBO route, WBO route, but hopefully we will see that Campbell-Garcia fight. That's how different the reaction was on social media to those two fights, by the way. Campbell and oh, Garcia sure. was right up there. And remember, I think your guy, I'm saying the American, is going to take the escape hatch and fight the American. You watch. Fight the American? Who's the American? Uh, sorry, fight um, in Inugi. So, I think. Oh, um, Emmanuel to go. You're talking about to go. Sorry, to go, not Inugi. You know, to, to he's go. from he's from Ghana, uh, in Africa. Um, but he's based in the U.S., though, isn't he? He his, you know, I guess he's been training in New York. I guess. But the the point is, you know, Garcia is only 20 and 0. He's only 21 years old. There's, I know he's in a hurry, but there is no hurry. That's the point. Yeah, but he's so marketable. That's the. I mean, if if he gets a win against a Luke Campbell. Yeah. If he gets a win against Luke Campbell, it sends him right up there because people then start to talk about Jorge Linares and all these guys that he could be compared to. And, you know, so I think what it gives him is a pedigree win. You know? Well, it also what it does is because he would then have the WBC's interim title, it would put him in the, in the position for a mandated fight against the guy that he says he wants to fight, which is the WBC's champion, which is Devin Haney. Devin Haney says he wants one of these big fights also. And that is two of the best young fighters in the sport, both in terms of their talent, in terms of their charisma, in terms of their possible marketability. That, I mean, look, we don't see a lot of those kind of fights at this stage of the game, but that would do boxing a lot of good. If, if, if somehow those sides could get together and make the fight. Now, they fight for different promoters, uh, but they're both, and at least in terms of the American television, it's not an issue because – Ryan Garcia is with Golden Boy, which has their deal with the zone. Devin Haney works with Eddie, who has his deal with the zone. So from a TV slash streaming service uh, uh, platform, no issues there. Golden Boy and Eddie have made plenty of deals together. Um, it's a great, great matchup. I mean, obviously, exactly. I have something to say about it. But we haven't mentioned his name yet, the Big L. 
um, the Matrix. Obviously, Lomachenko comes into the discussion as well, doesn't he? Well, he comes into the discussion only from the standpoint that most people think he's the number one lightweight in the world, and a lot of no. And then Campbell Campbell had a very good fight with him. Remember, he did, but it wasn't it wasn't like Lomachenko ultimately didn't dominate the fight. And look, Lomachenko is not in the equation for that group of fighters at the moment because he is off. Uh, just started his training camp in in the Ukraine this week uh, as he prepares for what everybody hopes will be a September nineteenth fight to unify uh, the belts between the Loma belt and the belts that are held and the belt that is held by. Tifimo Lopez Jr., that's a, that's a big-time fight also. Top rank. Dan, Dan, can that happen behind closed doors, do you think? That is to be determined. I know the, what, what Bob Aaron from Top Rank hopes to do is at the least have that fight take place in an open-air uh, venue with at least some fans. Mm. That can happen or not. Now, like Las Vegas is where he would like to have the fight. The problem right now is that the, the number of cases as – has been happening in many places in the United States because of our citizenry and our government with a complete ineptitude how to handle this and how to do things the right way, but we'll save the politics for another time. Uh, the cases in the state of Nevada are skyrocketing as they are in plenty of other places. So what, ha what, what the thought was just a couple of weeks ago where maybe by September they, there'll be few enough cases where you can start to open up in a, in a meaningful way and at least have people distanced you know, in a stadium you know, the thought now is because the number of cases is like tens of thousands a day is so terrible that there may not be an ability to have fans in the, in the stadium or in an arena. That said, I do think that uh, the fighters are going to dictate whether they're interested to do that. I think the hunger on both sides to get in the ring, that they would probably be able to work something out, even if it was for a, a different level of a purse, where they would still theoretically be able to do that fight if there was no crowd. I hope that's not the case. That's the kind of big fight where fans deserve to be there and the boxers deserve to have the fans there cheering for them. Uh, but if they can't, they can. They'll just have to make a decision. Do I go with my career and have a, a basically, at least in the terms of for Tiafima Lopez, a defining fight? Um, and also for Lomachenko, his, his stated goal from day one, it was to you know win as many belts as he could and as many divisions as he could. He wants to unify. This is a chance for him to get yet another one of the lightweight titles. You know, I guess I guess they might have to think about doing it without a crowd. Yeah, um, my feeling is the more this thing stretches out and people don't and, and, and we get more and more spikes, I yeah. think we're going to get some great fights made very quickly. I really do think we're going to have a great year of fights because well, you are, you're a lot more optimistic than those fights then because the landscape's going to have to change. You know? You're more optimistic than me. You just are. I'm always more optimistic than you. You're, I don't you're, know about that. In, you're, in you're, this particular case, you are. You're lemonade and Coke half empty. I'm lemonade and Coke half full, baby. Listen, like I said all along, I hope that it happens. I hope we get a lot of great matchups. But I am always skeptical because more often than not, boxing as an entity, without I'm not blaming one particular person or group, somehow finds a way to fail the public and fail the fans. I mean, it's the new normal. And we're going to change it in the new normal. Right, listen, last, last thing, right? Last thing, because I've got, I've got to run, because that, that, that fish is nearly ready. I can hear it subject. screaming to be cooked. Um, um, and, but anyway, on our next show as well, we're going to talk about fish, because we're going to talk about the whale and the giant squid, because need, that needs to come to an end, that, that rivalry. Giant squid. Going with the whale, baby. Giant squid. Watch previous episodes if you don't know what I'm on about. Dan, yeah, finally, is Masvidal going to get it done against Usman for the UFC welterweight belt? I want an answer in Yas Island, in Fight Island, uh, this weekend. Is he going to get it done? Okay, this is now like I've, uh, I have fulfilled my quota for the year of discussing UFC. I have absolutely no idea because I don't know the fighting of either man. But I will take your view. And some things I've read in other... Uh, other, you know, on the internet and different opinions, the, the general consensus is that while people respect what he's doing by taking the fight on short notice, that the champion is going to retain the title. So I'm going to make that pick and say he, he keeps the title. That's my pick, but there's just this little chance that Masvidal, who's very unorthodox and does unusual things and really believes himself, takes the belt. And I'm just feeling that a crystal ball is appearing here. And he may just get the job done. Dan? I hope that, I hope the main thing is 
Hit the fans and everybody gets a good fight. Exactly. Next time. Next time, brother. Touch them up. <laughs>